I remember like thinking at the time, you've met somebody really great and he wants to be in your life and wants you to be in his life. And you, if you keep doing drugs and fucking up, you're going to fuck this up. This is Joe Wong. Welcome to The Trap Set, where each week we explore the lives of drummers. I want to play something for you. You're hearing Pacific 231 by Burning Airlines, featuring my guest, Peter Moffat, on drums. Moffat cut his teeth in the DC punk scene and played with many of the most inventive bands to emerge during the 80s and 90s, including Government Issue, Wool, Dove, and Burning Airlines. His signature style balances jagged, angular rhythmic invention with arena rock bombast. In recent years, Moffat has become a respected drum tech and currently works for Kelly Clarkson drummer, Lester Estelle. Last month, Peter's band Second Letter released its debut album, and he's also back in the studio recording a new album with his former bandmate cum producer, Jay Robbins. I spoke to Peter in Los Angeles. And now my conversation with Peter Moffat. My mom, when she worked, she was a like mechanical artist. So she used to work for government contractors. You know, she was she was like doing maps and stuff like that. And I seem to remember uh, she was from Austria. My dad met her during the war, um, and at some point she was working for some company. And, and we used to have this map in our kitchen. It was a city map of Vienna, and it was all drawn by hand. And she was one of the people who had worked on it. And it, you know, it's almost as big as this table, like the length of it. Um, and my dad was a uh, technical writer for Applied Physics Laboratory, which was part of Johns Hopkins University. But my dad also played piano, and he was an AFM member, and he used to do like the cocktail circuit the society circuit in DC and play gigs at like embassies embassies are like the soul grave club or the university club or, you know, those kind of like members only type places. So, so they're both pretty technically minded. Did that rub off on you? No, I'm as dumb as a fucking <laughs> box of hammers. <laughs> Come on, man. No, I'm totally stupid. <laughs> do you feel that way? Yes. <laughs> I am a dullard. How and, many do and you have a, siblings? And a, and a Luddite. I am all of those things. Uh, I do. I have, Two brothers. I had two sisters. One of them passed away uh, in 95 from a brain tumor. Your father was in the Army? Yeah, or? he was in the Army. So he was in the Army during World War II. Mm -hmm. So were you one of the younger kids in your family? I was the youngest. Right. I was the, I was the surprise. You're like the tail end of the baby boom yeah. generation. I was born in 65. Right. Got it. So, and my, the joke is my mom found out she was pregnant with me on April 1st. So when she announced that, oh, I'm going to have a baby, everyone was like, ah, ha, 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 ha. you know, <laughs> April Fool's funny. You know, no, really, I'm serious. So, yeah. So me and I think there's a 12-year gap between me and my next oldest sibling. So I kind of basically grew up an only child. Did you inherit a cool record collection from one of your siblings or anything like that? Mm. Kind of. I wouldn't say, like, in here. I guess I did. I don't know. Like, I remember as a kid, in, in the summertime, I had, a, like, a, you know, record player where you could stack records up. And I, literally, I was, like, eight. And uh, so I remember used to listen, I used to listen to a, a mixture of, 
<laughs> like Winnie the Pooh and the, the Blustery Day, uh-huh. uh, Peter and the Wolf, uh, the Beatles' White Album. Uh, you know, it was just like this weird like mixture of like total kid stuff, and then like here's some you know experimental music from the Beatles. You know, so I would say that the Beatles' White Album, especially some of the songs on it, sound like they could be made for kids. Maybe, yeah. yeah. Like, uh, was yeah. were those just records that were left around the house? Yep. I had uh, the Shocking Blue, uh, Venus on a single, uh, Beach Boys, uh, California Girls, and I can't remember what the B-side to that was. Um, so a whole bunch of those kind of like cool, like Monkeys, Last Train to Clarksville, mm-hmm. um, all cool stuff. I mean, I, it, all that shit still holds up. The Monkeys was my first ever concert. Was, was it the, really? It was their reunion tour yeah. in eighty. Seven. Yeah, I saw them uh, play at the new 930 Club. I can't remember when it was, but I had never seen the Monkees before, and I wanted to see them. And they were cool, right? Sure. But I thought, I always felt like they'd be cooler if they, because like their show had a lot of shtick in it, like, oh, we're, we're wacky, we're crazy, we're the Monkees, remember us? But like, had they just stuck to their guns and been a band, yeah. and like, just here are some songs, and we're going to play you some songs. Like, that would have been way cooler. And I remember years earlier, you can tell I've had a lot of coffee because I'm like, blah, 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 blah. Uh, I saw Peter Tork play at the old 930 Club as billed as the Peter Tork Project. And I think it was like a four-piece. And that's exactly how they were. They just played songs, and they crushed them. And it was like, holy shit, this was absolutely amazing. I think it's time for them to do a screening of Head with the <laughs> a live orchestra. Wow. That's such a great movie. <laughs> Is it? <laughs> Have you not seen it? I, I think I've seen parts of it. I haven't seen the whole thing. Oh, no. But wasn't dude. it written by Jack Nicholson? He was too? one of the people involved in it. I think Peter Fonda was involved. What was Like, the f- MTV wouldn't be, M- well, M- when MTV was cool, uh, wouldn't be MTV without that movie. Right. Well, I remember uh, the monkeys from when MTV started rerunning the old episodes right. in the 80s. Right. That was my introduction to that. Mm-hmm. But what was the first record you bought with your own money? I think it was The Beatles' Help. Were you a happy kid? I don't know. I think I grew up kind of in, like, fortunate. Like, I don't really ever recall being want for anything. But at the same time, uh, I was... Like I said, I kind of grew up as an only child, so I didn't really have any. Like, I don't think of my brothers and sisters as brothers and sisters. Like, to me, they're more kind of relatives. Like aunts and uncles. Kind of. Yeah. Like, I think they're all awesome, and I really like them, but I love them. But I don't, we, we never had that, like, sibling, like, you know, either extreme love or extreme, fuck, you know, fuck you, I hate you. You know, there was none of that. Um, and... I had friends, but like my my mom was kind of like super uptight to be around, and so she, I hardly ever had anybody over. Like coming over to my house was like a deal breaker. That's not going to happen. Why was she so uptight? Because she was just like neurotic. Austrian. Yeah, Austrian. <laughs> that's that's a terrible thing to say. I don't think that's correct. I think she just was literally kind of just uptight, and I always feel like every uh, character flaw that I that I have, I can trace back to her. So, Have you ever told her that? No, she's dead. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So yeah. there's, her spirit will haunt you when she hears this podcast. Maybe. But it's um, okay. Yeah. Have you actually consciously figured that out through therapy or something? No, I just kind of like just looked at it just like, oh, she does all these things. And, well, I do them too. And it's really terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel like the version that manifests itself in your behavior is moderated by a generation? Maybe. I don't know. That's a good question. Yeah. I don't know. Because, like, I think I'm a cool person. Like, I think I'm a nice guy and I'm fun to be around. And, and I'm sure my mom thought the exact same thing. But me, like, I, you know, was always not comfortable or close. See, my mom will say something like, I know I'm a hard person to be around. Oh, yeah, no, my mom never said that. (laughs) (laughs) And she'll be like, you're a hard person to be around, too, Joe. Yeah. I'm like, oh, interesting. Yep. (laughs) 
When did you get into punk rock? It was literally over the course of a summer. Like, I think I was in getting ready to enter my junior year in high school. And um, like, I used to skateboard a lot. And I had friends who used to skateboard. And I used to go over to this one guy's house. And we would kind of hang out. And uh, he was getting into like punk rock music. And there was this kind of skateboard team in Maryland called the East Coast Toke Team. Uh, and those dudes were, it, it was a combination of like kind of dead heady pothead guys and then also like punk rock and it, they were sort of bridging the, you know, the gap kind of. And uh, so we all just kind of like started to listen. Like I seriously, for, in that summer, I went from listening to like Emerson, Lincoln Palmer to the Dead Kennedys, like, like, you know, like the, the <laughs> yeah. needle across the record. Um, so, yeah, that would have been 81 mm -hmm. ish, 81, 82. And then I remember uh, there was this girl who went to my high school. Her name was Mary Sala, but uh, she also w went by Janelle Sala and she was kind of into new wave music and punk rock and she had these parties in her basement. I think maybe she had more than two, but I went to at least two of them. And the first one I went to was like, I think in the fall of 81. Yeah, I think. And, you know, I was totally like the nerdy kid, like wearing a Rush t-shirt, like, Grr. and, um, and there were all these like serious punk rock people from DC who were there. And I remember actually Government Issue was the first band I ever saw play in her basement with Brian Baker playing bass, I think. And I remember, you know, John Stab, this is a song called Asshole, you know, and just like the whole idea of like, what, you wrote a song called Asshole? Like, holy shit. Um, and it was just, I don't know, it was just kind of cool. Like, it, I totally felt like an outsider, like I had no business being there, but at the same time, Nobody really paid me any mind, and the music was kind of fun. Uh, and so, and I remember she had another party in the spring, and I went to that. Had you already been playing at that point? Yeah, I've, sure, I've, I've been playing music the whole time. When did you start playing drums? Mm. Uh, you know, like junior high school. Like in band program, or yeah. And um, had you tried other instruments before that? Yes, like I. I when I was in elementary school, I, I wanted to play drums. Like I, when I was, you know, like a toddler, like I used to take the pots and pans and line them around the kitchen and beat them with wooden spoons. Um, and I remember when, my, when I had my tonsils taken out when I was like five, like when I got back from the hospital, like my parents bought me one of the, you know, like a paper headed drum kit from Toys R Us or something, which I demolished in, you know, a week or something. And then and then I kind of stopped. I didn't do anything. And then I'm in elementary school and you know, they have like a school band program where they're basically like introducing you to all the instruments. Our our music teacher was obviously she was a music ed major and so now she's teaching music. And uh, I remember when she was, you know, introducing everyone to instruments, I was like, I want to play drums. And looking back on it now, I could tell that you know, when she was a music ed major, like percussion just went, you know, like right <laughs> over her head or she, she didn't have the patience for it or, you know, any of that kind of stuff. So she was basically like, yeah, that's not going to work. You know, like <laughs> what, pick something else, you know? And, and so I picked saxophone and so I played saxophone and I actually played saxophone all the way through, uh, junior college. So, I mean, I was, I would say I was like, if you could, if you put sheet music in front of me, I could play it. Could I solo over giant steps? No. <laughs> did, did you play tenor? No, I played alto. Okay. So I, I just I couldn't get the the freeform soloy kind of like I there was a, a jazz improv class I took when I was at junior college and the guy who taught it was a legit great sax player and you know and he, and there's all these little tricks that you can yeah. you know you just kind of gotta it's like a bag of tricks you know you have to practice those things and I just couldn't couldn't get it so I don't know did drumming make sense to you right away when you finally yeah got to do it pretty much and when did you get a drum set um again it, this was kind of like a like a slow process like there was this there was this kid and in, in retrospect he was kind of a jerk and I didn't like him but uh 
uh, he had like a, his his parents were having a yard sale, and there was a snare drum and a hi hat stand that they were getting rid of, and I bought it for like ten dollars or something like that, and then. And just those two pieces themselves weren't really enough to like have everything kind of click. So maybe a year went by. And then at some point, the kid's parents were like, you know, we have this bass drum and rack tom and it's just sitting here. Why don't you get, let's give it to that kid, you know? And so basically they just gave it to me. Yeah, why would they have sold half of the I have drum set? No idea. That's <laughs> so weird. Not a clue. But anyway, I inherited the rest of it, and that's when it kind of like, okay, I get this. Then this. the sounds that you've been hearing on records, yes, you, kind of, you're able to replicate it. Yes. Like I remember sitting behind the kit and like kind of doing like a roll through like just the snare drum and the rack tom, and it was just like, whoa, you know, like total like Yes. And uh and you know, it was it was on from that point, and then the summer that everything changed, where I went from Emerson, Lake, and Palmer to the Dead Kennedys. Um, did you still listen to Emerson, Lake, and Palmer? I still were, do. What are you talking about? Well, I'm saying, but did, was there a period where you felt like you had to at least where it was like a disavow, like a guilty pleasure, you had to like hide no. those records for when your friends came over? No, <laughs> <laughs> see, because like none of my friends ever came over because my mom, mom, mom was is a drag. deal breaker. Exactly. Gotcha. So it was. <laughs> It was totally cool. Um, no, I never, there was never like a, a thing. Although it's funny, um, like I remember I used to listen to Emerson, Lake and Palmer and I had friends in high school uh, and, and we used to hang out at this one kid's house whose mom was cool where you could come and hang out. And we used to listen to all that shit. We used to listen to like Emerson, Lake and Palmer. We used to listen to Rush. We used to listen to King Crimson. We used to, we used to listen to UK, um, you know, like all this progressive rock kind of stuff. And um, so I had I was had all, all of that stuff. And then... Did you aspire to be that kind of a drummer? Yeah, I thought Carl Palmer was totally a badass. And he is a badass. Um, Phil Collins was on this show and he was bad mouth in Carl Palmer. Was he really? Yes. What did he say? He said that he sounded too studied and not from the heart. Yep. I you know, okay, so here's let me let me let me carry on. So okay, so like I stopped listening to that music and like decades went by where I wouldn't listen to it. Maybe I'd listen to like the first side of Tarkus or something cuz that's pretty fucking rad. Um but anyway, like I was drum teching name dropping, I was drum teching for Alanis Morissette and we were in Italy, in Milan, doing this uh, like MTV type show. And uh, the house sound guy was ringing out the PA system and he played this Emerson, Lake and Palmer song off of like Trilogy. And it's the one that, are you, are you Emerson, Lake and Palmer guy? Not super deep. Okay, so I won't sing it for you then. But it was a song that I remembered really liking. I'm like, oh my God, this is so cool. I really love this song. I hadn't heard it in forever. So when I got back home, I, you know, I went to a record store and I bought the record and I put it on and I listened to it and I was like, this fucking sucks. <laughs> this is all, it's so self-indulgent and it's so stiff and just everything is like, so like, you know, with my glasses, nerd glasses. <laughs> um, so I had like this kind of like violent, rea like like knee jerk violent reaction. Like this is terrible. But now I can kind, kind of listen. just depends on what mood you're in, right? Totally. I can listen to it again, and I'm like, yeah, okay, yeah, this is there's some really cool shit going on here. But not hearing it for such a long time was just like, whoa, this is what is this? This is <laughs> this is stupid. It was now being filtered through your punk mind. Totally. <laughs> This episode of The Trap Set is brought to you in part by Colectivo Coffee, handmade coffee since 1993. Check them out online at colectivo.com. 
All right, so you're in high school. Earlier you referred to yourself as stupid. I mean, did you feel like a dumb kid in school? I think I was an average kid. What were your aspirations at the time? Did you want to be a professional musician? Playing a band, <laughs> totally. Being Kiss. You want like even like when you were into punk, did you want to be a rock star? Yeah, absolutely. Who doesn't? Well, I feel like, uh, especially in the DC scene, mm-hmm. um, the my perception was that uh, people were kind of disavowing the rock star lifestyle yeah. or the cult of personality. Yes. Although certain figures in that scene themselves are yes. incredibly charismatic and very much cult of personality. Yeah, yes, exactly. Absolutely. But the the ethos, the underlying ethos, is yes. like we're all just regular right. people, right. like. Kisses bullshit. Uh, screw the theatricality. Yes, but no. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, so, like, I remember um, being in this band called Dove. Which are you, are you familiar? Yeah. Okay, so, um, so I remember one day, me and Eric, uh, the singer, uh, we went over to Discord House, and Discord House. You know, okay, like everything you just said, you know, like disavow, blah, blah, blah. The first Motley Crue video I ever saw was at Discord House. Wait, what? Yeah, it was on MTV. Oh, you mean you saw, oh, I, yeah, yeah, it was on gotcha. television, like yeah, yeah. in the living room. Like there was, you know, uh, looks to kill. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first time I ever heard except was at Discord House. So, you know, for all like rock and roll is bullshit, there was a lot of fucking rock and roll going on. In, well, that, in that scene. I just saw Ian a couple of weeks ago, and mm-hmm. we were talking about Ted Nugent for a good chunk of time. So. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, so, you know, I think there's, as, as much as DC, like, I don't think anybody tries to, like, publicly disavow any of that type of stuff. I mean, they just don't talk about it. But, yeah. they, but you, I don't know, maybe it's... It's it's well, in it there. It seemed like the, it's the, in there. the way that the the scene was operating was counter to the rock star system. Yeah, it was like, like let's just put out the records ourselves. Any, or and or see what anybody happens. can be in a band. Yeah. You want to start a band? Start a band. You yeah. know, do do whatever. Do your yeah. thing. Yeah, you know. So that's that's kind of how it worked. Um, but Dove, I felt like 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 Dove, uh, the the rumor is that. We used to be called ENB because we couldn't think of a name for ourselves, and ENB stood for Eric's New Band. Um, and then, and this was after Eric was in Double O, and that band broke up. So the, the rumor is is that Ian had a dream about us. Like he was like, I don't remember if he had talked to Eric or it was Tony or whoever, um, but he told someone, "Oh, I had a dream about you guys. You guys were playing at the Capitol Center, which was the big arena at the time, and you guys were called Dove." So. <laughs> so okay so now we're called dove cool. yeah so after you finished high school what was your plan play <laughs> you said you went to jun- junior college yeah i went to junior college and then i transferred to the university of maryland like i feel like it was just all like i wanted to be in a band you know what did you study at school music mm-hmm. um again you know you know like going looking looking back had i to do it over again, I should have been more like if I really wanted to be a musician. Um, you are a musician, but you know what I mean, like like a, a studied mi- like musician. a cat. Yeah, yeah sure. It, but a, is that what you like? like do you regret that you're not that person? Uh, like, do you want to be yeah, a cat? I don't now? know. It'd be kind of cool to be a, like a cat with a K. <laughs> um, <laughs>
This episode of The Trap Set is brought to you in part by Merge Records, the label that over the last 25 years has been home to many great bands, including The Magnetic Fields, Spoon, and Neutral Milk Hotel. Check out recent releases by Y Oak, Superchunk, Tracy Thorne, Titus Andronicus, and Ott. Listeners of this podcast get 20% off any order by visiting mergerecords.com and using coupon code TRAPSET. As always, domestic shipping is free. Again, go to mergerecords.com and enter Trapset at checkout to get 20% off your purchase. Merge Records, home of independent music since 1989. Did you grow up in a religious household? I say I'm a recovering Catholic. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Pity me. Um, like... I, my folks made me go to church every Sunday. I had to go, because I went to public school, I had to go to CCD yes. class every once a week up until my confirmation. And then my confirmation, my folks were like, okay, Peter, well, you know, we've given you the, the, the building blocks for all of this. Now the rest is up to you. Do you want to continue to go to church? And I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to watch fucking Kung Fu action theater or, or you know, Tarzan movies because that's what they used to show at like 11 o'clock on Sundays on, on w, television on yes. WDCA Channel 20. Um, so, yeah, that was pretty much the end of my religious upbringing. And it's been that way ever since. When did you figure out that you were gay? <laughs> that's a good question. Uh, probably when I was, although I didn't really think of it, like five you know, mm-hmm. like, I don't know, it was just kind of like, oh, yeah, probably. But I didn't, you know, it wasn't like a concept. It was just sort of like a gut feeling right? kind of thing. And like then, yeah, sexuality is for any five-year-old. It's exactly. a gut feeling. Yeah. Like, oh, I'm wrestling around with my friend and this feels really good. And <laughs> yeah. Like, why is that? So that's kind of where that was at. Did growing up Catholic fuck with your head? Fully. Yeah. Holy shit. Absolutely. Man, I have like guilt like you would not believe. Did you feel like you could control your sexual orientation as a kid? Like, did you try to like, did you date women? Yeah, you know, I had a girlfriend or two here and there. Like when I lived here in L.A., I had a girlfriend, actually, and we were really close. Um, And actually, we are still friends to this day. Um, Yeah, I tried. And but in the back of my head, I was always like, this is just, you know, convenient. So Mm -hmm. when really I wanted to, you know, fuck guys, fuck dudes. Exactly. When did you acknowledge it to yourself? When I lived here, when I was in living in LA, I kind of acknowledged it to myself. So you moved here after uh, college. Yeah. I lived here from 90 to 93. Okay. But I remember one night I, I had gotten really fucked up. Like I was high as a kite. And there was this adult bookstore that was kind of around the corner from where I used to live in North Hollywood. Um, And there was an adult bookstore around there. And I remember I went to the adult bookstore and one thing led to another and I had an experience. Okay, let's just... An encounter. An encounter, yes. A sexual encounter. And uh, I remember the next day, like, thinking about it. And rather than being, like, horrified or, like, guilt-stricken, I just started laughing. Like... Oh my God, ha ha ha, this is hilarious. You know, like, this is, two, two. Uh, this is, you know, this is it, you know, no big deal. Like, it Did just, it feel like a weight had been lifted to a certain extent? A little bit. Like, I, it just seemed like, oh, this is something I should probably explore a little bit more because this feels right. And you, you still had a girlfriend at the time? No. No, okay. Yeah, so that was, uh, I moved back to D.C. actually, so... Yeah, that was that all happened like over the course of a summer. Yeah, it was really weird. It was a very bad part of my life. So the fallout from that realization was bad or everything that was kind of centered around it. Like I was doing I think I was having a hard time coping with the fact that I was gay at that time. So I was masking it by like self-medicating and this city really is a great enabling city for oh, yeah. you to, you know, go down that rabbit hole if you if you want to. Like it's there and it's easy if you really want to do it. And so I was I was doing that and every and as a result of that, you know, everything was kind of falling apart. Um and I was just having like a personal crisis. <laughs> and it was it was time to go. How did you get out of that personal crisis? Uh 
I had like when I was still living here, I had tried to kind of clean up like I like a bunch of friends who were 12 steppers, like totally 12 stepped me. Like it was really it was kind of cool in one way. Like I remember like I had kind of reached out to a friend of mine who was in the program. And then seriously, like over the course of the next couple of days, like I just kept getting phone calls from people like, hey, hey, hey you know, like come do this, come do that. And uh and that's a great thing to have here as a resource, you know, like if you're really struggling, man, people are like more than willing to help you. Um, but really what, what it was, was I'm meeting my partner. He totally kind of was the power greater than myself. They talk about in 12 step programs, like, and when did you meet? Like I was living, I left, I left LA. I moved to Morgantown, West Virginia. I was living in Morgantown, West Virginia, but I came down to DC in October. So yeah, October of 93. So, so it's been 25 years almost. Yep. That's amazing. Yep. Congratulations, man. Thanks. Yeah. He puts uh, up with me. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, you do. No, I don't. Really? You don't? <laughs> Not a clue. He hasn't told you? <laughs> he says, he says he's too old to train somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> so what does it mean that he trained you? How did he change you? Uh, I, I don't know. He didn't. I don't know. He's just, he was just a good dude. I love him. And I, I don't know. He's like, I, re I remember like thinking at the time, like you've met somebody really great and he wants to be in your life and wants you to be in his life. And you, if you keep doing drugs and fucking up, you're going to fuck this up. Which drugs were you doing? All the bad ones. All of them. Yes. Wow. Yes. Um, so that was like a conscious effort on my part to like, okay, this has to stop. And so, so then how did your life change when you gave that shit up? I had, I got a boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you already had a boyfriend. Yeah. But now, you know, it, now I have 25 years later, um, we're still together. That's how that, that's what changed. Call it love with a new face and you got the growth in the street. Cause we're all headed west. I was working doing backline at this at the Strums Unlimited company. Uh, I, you know, I mean, I got in another band. I, you know, was playing music and. Which band was that? Uh, I was playing uh, Burning Airlines. Well, I remember that band. Uh, when did you guys start? Ninety seven. Ninety seven. Ninety eight. Yeah. Uh, I saw quite a few of those shows. Did you really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, how did you hook back up with, uh, with Jay? Jay? Yeah. Okay, so, all right. So, I've, you know, Jay and I have always been in touch all through, uh, you know, after government issue when he was in Jawbox and I was in Wool. Um, and when I moved back to the area in D.C., you know, we s still stayed in touch. And then at one point, uh, towards the end of Jawbox, Zach announced that he was going to leave the band, but they still wanted to be Jawbox. So I was going to be the drummer. So I had worked up a whole bunch of Jawbox songs and we had actually like had a rehearsal or two as Jawbox. And I think the idea was they were gonna go to Europe and do a tour. And then uh, Jay kind of just sort of decided, you know what, I don't wanna, I don't wanna be Jawbox anymore. So that was, that was the end of Jawbox, and but he wanted to do a band, so he and Bill and me, we decided, or Jay decided, and then Bill and I were invited. I don't know how that worked. Um, that we were going to do this, you know, three piece. And that it was going to be. Ultimately, we settled on the name Burning Airlines after Brian Eno song. Yeah. So the other options were El Toro, uh, Staring Daggers. I think was another name that we had on the on the wall. T you know, to see what we thought about it. Um, so yeah, we started rehearsing as Burning Airlines and made a record and played some shows and then Bill left and we did a tour and we got this guy Charlie Bennett to fill in for him and then after that tour we got Mike Harbin to come and be in the band and then we decided, this is <laughs> the Burning Airlines uh, history in a nutshell, and then we decided that 
it would be better to have like another guitar player. So we got my best friend, who's this guy, Ben Pape, to come in and play guitar. Um, and then we broke up. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you break up? Uh, I think we broke up because the writing was on the wall for the band. Um, like we couldn't, we just couldn't seem to, to get any real momentum happening. Like I remember we were, we were on this little East coast Southern tour and like all the shows were just kind of miserable, like, you know, playing to 20 people, 30 people kind of stuff. And it just, that shit takes its toll on your psyche. Especially after, after you've done bigger tours. Yeah. Like Jay had done. And yeah, you had done. exactly. Yeah. I don't know. It's, you know, it's humbling. Um, but at some point you're just like, why am I doing this? this you know, this is, it's kind of, it's hard. Um, was it bringing you joy to play every night? When we were good, yeah, absolutely. What percentage of the time do you feel like you're, you're playing is good? <laughs> like, are you hard on yourself? Very. Um, I'd have to, like, maybe 20% of the shows I can walk away from. I'm like, yeah, that was really good. <laughs> the other 80 are just kind of like, uh, yeah, it was okay. So, have you always been that way? You'd have to ask other people who were. I thought in you were going to say you'd have to ask my mom. It's no, you don't. Yeah, to totally have to. <laughs> no, ask ask all the people I used to be in bands with. They'd probably tell you, yeah. So, do you aspire not to be that way? Yeah, absolutely. Like it would. I'm trying. I'm trying to be more. You know, it's always a work in progress. How did you get into drum teching? It had become known to me that they, the B fifty twos, were going to actually go out on a summer tour. And they needed a drum tech. And I basically was like, I'll do it. So that's how I got my foot in the door. As somebody that's so hard on yourself, is it somewhat liberating to be facilitating someone else's vision um, in that regard? I, like you're, you're there to help the drummer out, basically, and yeah, the artist. Yeah. Uh, yes, until they have a, uh, an opinion that's different than mine, <laughs> 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 which has happened. Um, you know, and then like it's, that's also a work in progress. It's like you have to know, like, okay, you're the boss. Earlier you were talking about the, the feeling that you got uh, at towards the end of Burning Airlines where mm -hmm. you were just questioning why you were doing it anymore. Mm -hmm. But now you're back, you're playing with Jay again, mm -hmm. making a new record with him, mm -hmm. and you're uh, doing another record, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what's Actually, the there's two other records. Okay, um, so what are the records that you're working so on? So there's the Jay Robbins thing, and then there's this band I'm in, and it's called Second Letter. So there's that band. And then I'm doing this other project with Jim Spellman, who was in Velocity Girl, uh, Bill Barbeau, who was in Jawbox, mm -hmm. and Brian Baker. So, and that band is called Foxhall Stacks. So if I ask you why you're doing it now, what your, what's your answer? It's fun. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's fun it, to do it. Does it feel the same as it always has? Uh, kind of. I don't know. Like, none of those bands play a whole lot of shows like like none of those bands will ever probably tour for like eight to ten weeks at a stretch so that isn't a factor um so it's it's fun you mm -hmm. know it's just it's enjoyable and uh and it feels good to do it and the recordings are good and it's well, that, and it's something saying a lot if you I know. think that they're good. <laughs> totally well well that's a whole nother can of worms because you do, if you listen to like a, the burning airlines records mm -hmm. are you happy with them mm, the first one not so much the second one more so wow okay so and it's mostly perform it's mostly performances well i really like that first burning airlines yeah, record see, i don't a lot of people seem to like it yeah but i think the second one is way better like i think the songs are better i think the performances are better like the sounds are better so i don't know like but the first one the kids bought it so <laughs> you know <laughs> and i've listened to it and i'm like yeah that's pretty cool well, yeah there's some cool stuff some going on there. Yeah, passed, you, it's a little bit of time put between you and it it's easier to listen to it and appreciate it for what it is pete moffett thanks for being here yep my pleasure Trap Set is produced by me, Joe Wong, along with Chris Karwowski, who also edits the program. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at The Trap Set, and visit our website, thetrapset.net, to subscribe to our show for free. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please donate to our show. If you can't afford to donate, please tell a friend and give us a good rating on iTunes. Send your feedback and guest requests to thetrapset at gmail.com. Trap Set.